Hello and welcome to lecture 38 of my class from data to decisions. Here I'm going to use Excel and R to generate some lag plots and to do a runs test. Recall that both of these are techniques for trying to detect and understand whether or not you have correlated residuals, whether or not the next residual you get somehow is related to the previous residual. So you need to time order for residuals uh, or use whatever other other natural sequence maybe it's a spatial variation or a temporal variation usually it's time but not always that you want so you order them first for example might be the order in which you made the measurements uh, here I show the MBS weight data we've used several times in this class and I have them by trial number so each measurement was made in a different week I believe and then 100 measurements so here's the sequence plot. The sequence plot simply plots the residual, in this case the difference between the measurement and the mean, uh, as a function of run number. And you look for any trends that might exist. I look at this, I don't really see much trends going on. Um, but it's easier to see what's going on in a lag plot. So down towards the bottom of this spreadsheet, I show the lag plot. where I plot the residual versus the residual lag one, previous residual. Now, notice that every data point, except for the first and last, is, is plotted twice. So this data point here uh, has, is also plotted. You notice that it has about a minus 30 value. It's also plotted down here. And so these two data points are the same data point plotted. Uh, once is the residual, and once is the residual lag one. These two data points are the same. So you'll see that. Uh, all over the place, especially you notice it with these kind of outlier-like points. What you expect to see if there is no correlation between the residuals is a scatter plot, uh, what looks like maybe artboards where you're throwing at the bullseye, but they kind of spread around the middle. So the concentration is mostly in the middle, and then they spread uniformly uh, around that zero, zero point. So looking at this, I would say I don't need to worry about correlated residuals. Here's another example where we measured uh, the intensity of a chaotic laser running freely uh, and we see a huge amount of structure right so a lot of systematic variation going on here this is not uncorrelated residuals where every measurement is independent of all the other measurements uh, we can see that in the lag plot as well uh, where you see obviously a, a Big spread that is uh, systematic uh, in some way, a lot of structure involved. I'm not even going to try to figure out uh, what that might be, but there's no way I could assume correlate, uh, uncorrelated residuals uh, for any kind of analysis. Here's the Mickelson data. This is uh, Albert Mickelson measuring the speed of light. He won the Nobel Prize for this kind of work. And he here we show 100 measurements that he made over of time and they're in sequence of when he made the measurements. Here's the speed residual in uh, 10 to the 6 meters per second versus run number. All right, now look at that data. Can you see some structure, some trends, some non-randomness uh, going on here? Uh, maybe. You know, you looked hard. You might be able to tease out what looks like something. I, I don't know. It's kind of hard. right? This is one of the problems with sequence plots. Unless the trends are very obvious, uh, there might be trends there that you don't detect. Now, let's look at the same thing as a lag plot. As a lag plot, we see a definite correlation, a definite upward trend from left to right and up. If I fit a straight line, I get a 0.535 slope. Um, if I do a correlation coefficient calculation, as, as shown here, I get a 0.535, slightly different value. In this case, they're almost the same. Sometimes they're a little bit more different, the slope and the correlation coefficient. But there's a definite trend going up. And this is uh, what we look for in this Ag plot. In the next set of be able to test for this correlation and ask is it statistically significant or just caused by randomness or uh, likely 
uh, due to randomness. Um, but this is the kind of trend we're looking for, this, this systematic variation where one res residual is correlated with the residual lag line. Uh, here's the Newcomb um, speed of light data. Looked at this in the homework. Uh, again, if we look at a lag, uh, excuse me, a run number plot, the residual versus a run number, I don't see much um, systematic variation. I see it looks like an outlier, second outlier possibly. But other than that, I don't see much. But again, you can't tell that much from the sequence plot unless it's very systematic. But if I go down and I look at my uh, lag plot, now residuals tend to stick all the data up in the corner here, but that looks like a kind of a normal spread. You'd probably want to look at it without those residuals. Um, what are the residuals? Minus 30 and minus 40. So uh, you try to, well, I won't do it here live, but you could delete them and, and take a look and see if you could uh, maybe see this graph a little bit more clearly without those two data points present. All right, one last example. This is a set of data uh, that uh, NIST has on their website, and it's a steel beam deflection. So they take a beam and they, they put some weight on it and they cause it, put some force on it, and they cause it to deflect, and then they measure the deflection. And they measure it multiple times. So every measurement is, is some time uh, delta apart from the previous measurement. All right. Now let's look at the beam deflection versus run number. Well, that's kind of interesting. It's not what we've seen before. It looks very spread out, but maybe too spread out. Uh, in fact, it kind of has some more of the values up at the top and the bottom. And notice how once it hits a certain point, other than maybe this data point, it's a per certain deflection, say 400 and minus 400, Beyond that range, there's no data. It cuts off in a sharp fashion. If I look at the uh, histogram, you see it actually has a bowl shape where the extreme values are more probable than the values in between. That's very odd. Very odd. Now, let's look at the lag plot. There is the lag one plot. Wow, that's fascinating. Have you ever seen anything like that? Did you ever expect to see that kind of behavior? It's a circle. It's an oval, rather. Uh, wow, what is that? What's going on here? It's like the, the data points are racing around in this big circle. Well, this is very systematic, very highly correlated, one residual to the previous residual. And they're correlated with time because the beam is oscillating. I've got this beam, and, and I... And I the, I hit it, but it, it wiggle. It's wiggling. It's not stationary. It's bouncing up and down. And we're seeing this time varying signal. And the samples, I'm getting multiple samples within one period. Right? Uh, so not lots of samples within one period. If I got lots of samples with one, within one period, this would look like a sinusoid. But I'm only going to get I'm only getting a couple of samples within each period. So you don't notice the sinusoidal behavior uh, in, in this raw data. If I had 20 points per period, it would very clearly look like a sinusoid, up and down and up and down. But I'm only getting a couple of points per period. Uh, the measurement period doesn't coincide with the oscillatory period of the beam. And as a result, uh, it all looks very random here. But it looks very systematic here. This is the power of this kind of time series analysis, where you can pull out time variations using these lag plots. Uh, fascinating field. You could do a whole course. People do whole courses just on time series analysis. We're not going to do that. Uh, we're going to stick to um, mostly non-time related data here. But certainly, if you see this kind of behavior, in a lag plot, you know there's a strong time dependence, in this case, a periodic time dependence. All right, let's go back to our Michelson data, and let's ask the question, can we test whether or not 
this correlated behavior we're observing is statistically significant. One of the tests we can use is called the runs test. All right, so let's look at what I do. We'll do this again in R, which will turn out it'll be a lot easier in R, like most things are, than in Excel. Um, what we're going to do is label each residual as either being negative or positive. So here I have a formula. It says if the residual, C9 in this case, is bigger than zero, then label P, otherwise label with an N. So you see that all of these points are labeled either N or P. Then I can count the number of P's and count the number of N's. So I use this count if statement. Grab all the values in this column and, and count it if the value is a P. And we can see there's 45 P's out of 100. Uh, count the number of N's, the 45 negative residuals. Uh, 45 positive residuals. Now we have 55 negative residuals. Next is I have to count. So two N's in a row, that's one run. One, two, three P's in a row, that's a second run. One N, there's a third run. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's a fourth run, etc. Keep doing that, and I count 28 runs. Now, I suppose I could have written a macro to do that, um, but I didn't. I just counted them manually and typed in the number 28. I'm not going to bother figuring out how to do it more in a more sophisticated way in Excel because I'd rather do it in R, which we'll show next. Now we can do the test. Here's our formulas for R bar and SR squared, the variance of R and the mean value of R, uh, the expected things we'd get if we really had a binomial distribution. So I calculate R bar using that formula, and it turns out to be 50.5. Um, for a large value of n, we're going to expect to get n over 2. n over 2 would be 50 exactly in this case. It's close, 50.5. The standard deviation, the square root of this formula here, uh, is about 5, which means that I take 28, subtract off R bar, 50.5, Divide by 4.9244, the standard error of R, and that gives me the Z value of R. It's minus. So this R is sufficiently less than what we'd expect. Four and a half standard devi deviations of what, away from what we would expect. That we get a very small P value. Right? So we calculate the P value, assuming that Z, sub R, Z underscore R is a normal distributed Z value. And the p-value you see is very small. So the chances of getting a number of runs this much less than 50.5 based on your chance is quite small. If r is much, much less than r bar, that means you have positive correlation. You have fewer crossings of zero than you would expect otherwise. So I'm able to determine using the runs test, Pickleson data, is positively correlated and with a p-value uh, that's quite small, probability of it happening by chance, very small. All right, let's do the same thing with the Mickelson data in R. So here I have a script that you can also find on the website, agplotandrunstest.r. First thing I'm going to do, read in the Mickelson data and generate a lag plot. So the lag plot is very easy to do. It's called lag.plot, and I give it the, the uh, residual value. So in this case, the, my Mickelson dot, here, let's run it. Look at the Mickelson data itself. Uh, you see it's got a residual column uh, that is directly from, directly from that Excel spreadsheet that we saw earlier. So uh, I can generate the lag plot just to, by running lag.plot, and sure enough, there it is. Um, and it shows the same behavior that we saw before. What I'm going to do now is do the runs test. And to do that, I first have to turn the residuals into factors. I do that in two steps. So here's my residual data. That's the array of the 100 residuals from this data. Uh, this function sign 
takes the sign of that data. So the output here would be an array of either a plus or a minus. Uh, it's just two, any two symbols would have been fine, but the sign function is a very simple one to use because I only care about crossing zeros. So is it below zero or above zero? So I use the sign function. Then the factor function will turn those signs into factors and factors will be plus and minus one. All right, so if I run that, all right, let me let me look at the x value. So let me just type x and dump the x values down here. You see, here's an array of 100 numbers, and they're either minus ones or plus ones. Like minus ones whenever I had a negative residual, and plus one whenever I had a positive residual. Now that the x, I have this x variable, this array that's set up to be either plus or minus one. I can do a runs test. The runs test is found in a library called T series. Uh, the, the, you have to install a package called T series, but I've already done that. So I'll simply execute the library T series to, to get that library set up. And then I will execute runs.test of X. Uh, so let's look at that. Runs.test of X gives me this result. Standard normal variable is minus 4.5691. I'll right, back to Excel real quick. Minus 4.5691. See, same value. So it performed the exact same calculation that we saw here in Excel. The p-value 2.45 times 10 to the minus 6, the same as we had before. And this, based on a one-tailed test, not a two-tailed test. I'm only testing for positive correlation here. So the default is a two-tailed test, but I set the alternative po uh, al our hypothesis to be equal to less. Uh, uh, so less um, means we get less runs than you expected. That's a sign of positive correlation. If I'm doing a one-tailed test where the alternative is we really do have positive correlation, not just any old correlation which is the same thing I did in my Excel spreadsheet. All right, so that's how you run a runs test in R, and you can see it's really quite simple to do. Uh, next time we'll talk about the Durbin-Watson test and how that works and how to perform those tests. Till then.